Hello and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. My name is Christopher Sands and I'm director of the Canada Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here to share with you the results of a year long effort to look at uh, how COVID was affecting the Canada US border. The Woodrow Wilson Center put together the Wilson Center's Task Force on Public Health in the US Canadian Border in October of 2020. And we recruited an all-star cast to help with uh, preparing the report. Uh, let me introduce the, each of the members in turn. We have here with us today, the Honorable Anne McClellan, a former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, former, uh, and in fact, first Canadian Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. We also have with us um, Christine Gregoire, former Governor of Washington State, uh, and very active now in both Challenge Seattle and the Cascadia in, in, in Ovation Corridor. I could get that out. Uh, <laughs> in addition, we have the Honorable Jean Charest, former Premier of the Province of Quebec and also uh, former leader of the Progressive Conservative Party nationally. And we have with us Governor James Douglas, former Governor of the State of Vermont. All of them have done outstanding work on the border in past lives. We drew on that expertise in order to pull together a report with the intention of advising the governments on how they could do a better job uh, in future pandemics and addressing some of the concerns that many citizens had in both Canada and the United States on the operation of the border restrictions. I'm going to now move quickly to a slideshow. Uh, sorry for the awkwardness there. We're going to go all the way up. And uh, yes, all right. Sorry for the uh, sorry for the goofiness there. There we are. So now I'm just going to briefly present the task force before inviting you in the audience to ask questions of our members. After we give each of them a brief opportunity to say something about the experience of the task force uh, as as they saw it. You see here the task force members. The task force was formed in October 2020. We met with US and Canadian government officials, business and community groups in both countries. We did it by Zoom. That was the nature of the border restrictions. We did most of this uh, remotely, but we had tremendous feedback, including hundreds of individual submissions from citizens uh, following a call from in for input that came from the Wilson Center and many media organizations helped to spread. Research and organizational support for the task force was provided by the Woodrow Wilson Center and my colleagues in the Canada Institute. In particular, the task force looked at how two previous government plans, both of which were North American, including Mexico as well, addressed using the border as part of a response to a pandemic. The idea was to restrict border access to slow the spread or stop the spread of a major pandemic. The North American governments had agreed, federal governments had agreed twice on a pandemic plan, first in 2007, following the SARS outbreak in, uh, in Canada, in Toronto, and also uh, the first avian flu outbreak, and then updated it again during the Obama administration in 2012 to include some lessons from, from, the, uh, from the second outbreak of avian flu. The task force identified some major things that went wrong with the implementation of border restrictions in the current COVID-19 pandemic. There was a lack of a plan to return to normal border operations, which caused problems making the border and its conditions unpredictable. Public confidence in the restrictions and their efficacy was eroded when the governments did not appear to be listening to the concerns of individuals, businesses, and others. And we observed that voluntary compliance is less costly than complete enforcement, and yet very little was done to engage the public in participating and, and taking responsible measures so they could cross the border safely. Instead, the border restrictions focused on the purpose of people's travel, which did not connect in any visible way to risk. We've also looked at some missed opportunities. National legislators, whether in the US Congress or in the Canadian Parliament, were largely marginalized. They could have helped. We also noted that greater coordination with other levels of government, including states, provinces, municipalities, could have helped, but were largely left uh, out of the conversation. And finally, having met with a number of private sector 
uh, firms and individuals with ideas for how the border could be better managed, we observed that partnerships with the private sector could have helped and talk a little bit in the report about how those could have been uh, set up to be most effective. And most importantly for the next pandemic, the task force made several recommendations. First, flipping the paradigm governing border restrictions from achieving zero risk to managing the risk of a pandemic. Second, because risk management requires data, we call on the government to provide a better data basis for making risk management decisions. We noted that trusted traveler and trusted shipper programs in which individuals and firms have voluntarily agreed to be partners in border security are platforms that should have been used as trusted testers for pilot projects and ideas to make the border work more smoothly. We also noted the government should provide options for cross-border travel, even if the restrictions are available for, are imposed for most travelers, there should still be options for urgent cases. Pilot projects should be ex executed with expedited authority and available to funding in a crisis. We do have mechanisms for pilot projects, but they weren't used in this particular crisis. They could have been. We think that the governments should look to adapt restrictions to local conditions. The 5,425 uh, mile long border has a lot of variety. And we thought the ability to adapt restrictions to particular conditions was a lost opportunity here. And in the future, we think all of this could be part of updating the North American plan for animal and avian pandemic influenza for a third time to better count uh, the lessons of this experience for future policymakers. So that, that in a nutshell is the report. I want to open the floor for questions. If you are watching the live stream of this event, you should be able to ask questions through a box that is on the screen uh, of the live webcast. And I will get those questions and I will uh, then relay them to our speakers. But let me begin by asking uh, our task force members if they would like to weigh in uh, with some observations about the experience of being on the task force. Um, perhaps I could start with you, Premier Charest. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, uh, colleagues, uh, Anne and, and uh, Governor Gregoire, Governor Douglas. Uh, uh, first, uh, allow me to congratulate uh, the Wilson Center and the Canada Institute and Chris Sands and your team uh, for the extraordinary work. We have had quite a process and in, in quite exceptional circumstances in examining the border issues, as all of us know. And, uh, and let me add maybe a few words in French. D'abord, je veux uh, saluer le travail exceptionnel fait par Chris Sands et l'équipe du Wilson Center et du, de l'Institut canadien. Uh, nous avons abordé un sujet, nous le reconnaissons d'emblée, qui a été très difficile pour les décideurs politiques. Et uh, dans, je pense que nous serions, nous sommes tous du même avis, qui, nous avons beaucoup, de, évidemment, de sympathie ayant nous-mêmes euh, été dans des postes de responsabilité pour la situation euh, dans laquelle ils se sont trouvés. I, I just reminding us that, you know, all four of us had, I think, a great deal of empathy for decision makers in this process. I mean, it, it was quite exceptional circumstances, a pandemic and, uh, and the impact that it had. And so uh, we were the first to recognize this wasn't an easy situation and one that uh, uh, called on them making difficult decisions and uh, and doing it in a record time, and so uh, so we uh, were very very uh, I think uh, thankful for their uh, their service and their leadership. That being said, it's extremely important for us to have a good assessment of what we've just been through, and to draw lessons from them, positive and negatives. And if only for one reason, there will be other pandemics. In fact, I think we were a bit surprised as we ran through the work to discover that after the SARS episode of 2003, there was a report produced in 2007. Frankly, I don't think a lot of people knew about this. And then after H1N1 of 2009, and, uh, and uh, we were in office, I was in office in 2003 and then 2009, there was another report published in 2012. And we had a sense that these reports were not very useful to governments when in fact they should have been at the time uh, of the pandemic. One marked difference between two, you know, the experience of 9-11 and what we went through now was 
In 9-11, the American government acted naturally, very rapidly, and they acted in their interest. And then they caught up with the Canadian officials. This time, it's as though a decision was taken to act uh, together and to be synchronized. Only what we discovered in looking at the process is that there was much less coordination than what we had uh, thought uh, uh, should have been, much less. There wasn't as much reach out as there should have been with legislators, uh, national, provincial, state level, uh, with the private sector, non-governmental organizations and individuals. And when we look back at how we applied uh, decisions, a lot of it was based on motivation uh, of travel. Of course, we protected fairly effectively the trade part of it and the goods part of it. But on a personal level, I don't think any of us uh, would, could underscore that a lot of people personally suffered through this period. They were separated from families, from friends, and uh, there was a very high cost uh, on a person that can't be measured, but was real. And, uh, and if only for that reason, we believe it would be, uh, governments would be well advised to look at a more of a risk management approach uh, than, uh, than a no risk or a zero risk approach would seem to be the case in, in part of the implementation of these policies. So that being said, I'll, uh, I want to thank Chris again and your team and colleagues. Real, it's been a real pleasure to work with you, and we look forward to hearing questions or comments. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Very much. Governor Gregoire, can I turn to you next? Governor Gregoire, you're still muted, unfortunately. Oh, my, my bad. I'm sorry. Uh, I join uh, Jean Jure in saying thank you uh, to the Wilson Institute. Uh, to uh, you, Chris, and your whole team, and to the distinguished colleagues that I was given the opportunity to, to work with. Um, you know, as, as uh, I, I think I can share with all of you, the frustration exhibited uh, across our border, Washington State and British Columbia, was made quite public evident by both the Premier and the Governor. Uh, and so when Chris suggested that I might join, I did I did absolutely wholeheartedly with really an understanding that the relationship between British Columbia and Washington State is simply tied at the hip. Uh, we have more economically in common, we have more culturally in common than I do with any of our neighboring states. Um, and really to put a fine point on it, when um, 2021 September came, we were to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Peace Arch that was erected in 1921. There are some engravings on that that really talk about how we view a common mother and how we are serve as brethren. But the most definitive one is one in which it says, may these gates never be closed. And they have never been closed until now, the 100th anniversary of that Peace Arch. And so I was driven to join in this effort to make sure we can add an again to that. So may these gates never be closed again. Um, and we have not before, and we've been through some very challenging times. When I was in office, we dealt with, like Jean Charest suggested, H1N1. Uh, and I believe the recommendations that you will find in this report are a reflection on what we heard from the public, from legislators, from electeds uh, who really passionately believe there's a better way. And I too salute those who served during COVID, unprecedented times and very challenging. I hope we will take the lessons learned from this experience and put those into play, unlike what has been done before and make sure that we in fact, never close our gates again. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Governor. And now to Governor Douglas. Thank you, Chris. And let me uh, thank all of my colleagues for uh, the opportunity to join them in this uh, task force work. Uh, I think we've become a, a very compatible quartet and look forward to <laughs> opportunities to, uh, to work with you all on future projects. Uh, it, it has indeed been a great process, as uh, my colleagues have indicated, uh, hearing from a wide variety of uh, those on both sides of the border and the public and private sectors who've had uh, experiences, um, some quite stressful, uh, but uh, all of which have been very instructive to our work and our recommendations. 
Uh, I think there are a number of lessons from this, and um, um, one, we are critical of, of our federal governments, but I, uh, I know that we intend it in a constructive way so that we can learn from this experience and, and uh, be uh, better prepared uh, for the inevitable next time, uh, whenever and whatever that may be. Um, but the, the need to uh, not uh, put these um, uh, past uh, reports on the shelf, as so often seems to happen in government, but to make them dynamic uh, documents and, and have a constant process of, of uh, planning and, and revising those plans so that uh, governmental entities are prepared and don't have to uh, uh, scurry around when, uh, when a, a difficult situation presents itself. Uh, I think the, the most important recommendation uh, to which we've already alluded is the uh, risk-based approach to uh, travel restrictions rather than the categorical approach. Um, as uh, Jean said, uh, uh, there are a lot of families, especially in our part of the world, uh, that have been separated. Um, uh, I have a good friend in Vermont who recently lost his uh, wife and uh, I met a, a lovely lady from Montreal, and they uh, became engaged and, and uh, <laughs> haven't been able to spend much time together yet, uh, but are looking forward to doing so. In real circumstances, uh, these are uh, families with, uh, with ill relatives uh, or those who are in very uh, tough shape uh, who have been separated. And we have to understand the, uh, the personal uh, sacrifice that people have been required to make and and understand uh, uh, the risk involved, which in many cases is uh, not as serious as uh, the restriction warranted. Um, the, the commercial impact is quite uh, serious. Uh, Jean mentioned that a lot of the commerce and trade uh, uh, have continued, but um, our northernmost ski area, for example, in Vermont, uh, gets a majority of its visitors from Quebec. And um, uh, this was a very difficult um, uh, winter this past time for not only that resort, but many others. Um, I, I must add parenthetically that we're going to have a great winter coming up, so everybody come to Vermont and uh, uh, spend some time with us. Um, but we, we have to uh, understand uh, uh, the impact of this kind of closure. Uh, to put it in perspective, 9-11 um, was a devastating blow to cross-border traffic, as everyone knows, and um, the number of Canadian visitors to Vermont never rebounded further than 75% of its pre-9-11 number. So uh, this is another serious blow, and it's going to be uh, a difficult challenge to, uh, uh, to uh, revert to where we were before. So I think a, a bottom line lesson of our experience is that we need to, uh, we need to minimize uncertainty. Uh, we need to uh, have um, uh, consistency, predictability in these processes and these uh, uh, procedures. We have to have um, um, restrictions in which the people of our respective countries have confidence um, they want to do the right thing, uh, but they have a right to know that they are rational, risk-based uh, decisions that our governments are making. So I, along with my colleagues, hope that this will have proved to be a useful and constructive experience and that our respective federal governments will uh, use these recommendations going forward. Thank you very much, Governor. And now to Minister McClellan. Going last, there's very little left to say. I want to say, as everyone else has, Chris, thank you so much to everyone at the Wilson Center uh, for working with us and guiding this project uh, to today. Um, and I want to say a big thank you, obviously, to Governors Gregoire and Douglas. Wonderful to get to know you both. And of course, my colleague, Jean Charest. It, wonderful to be able to work with you again. Um, let me say that uh, for me, and I was the health minister in the government of Canada during SARS, the most important thing we did was the lessons learned exercise after we were through the uh, global health event. And uh, so in terms of, I think, both governments doing a lessons learned exercise, and hopefully as it relates to the land border, especially doing a lessons learned together as partners, I expect each country will do their own. Uh, but it, I think to to be able to encourage both governments to work together on a lessons learned around the land border in particular uh, is going to be very helpful. And I expect, I hope that both governments work together in a spirit of collaboration to make that happen. And then the other thing I would say uh, about that 
is that after SARS in 9-11, we actually rebuilt our public health system in Canada. And we obviously still have gaps. That's one of the things COVID has taught us. But we would have been so uh, less well prepared for COVID had we not actually made the commitment to deliver on the recommendations in the Naylor report. So it's one thing to do a lessons learned exercise, but if it's not acted on, it really doesn't ameliorate or, or help the planning for the next time. And as Sean said, there will be a next time. And I'm having trouble with my headset here. I never use them, so I apologize for that. Um, so, and I would say one of the other things that we really need to think about, and I would hope a lessons learned exercise takes up and we re reference in the report, is the fact that we live in the age of digitization. Therefore, data collection, analytics. We need to be figuring out how we use data collection, keeping in mind the privacy issues, but the collection and the use. So individual citizens and families can uh, have confidence uh, in the use of that data, whether it's two vaccinations or other kinds of information, but that that information is then used to expedite the movement of people across borders. And I, I think, um, I, thinking about the government of Canada, I think we need to modernize how we serve our citizens. And certainly that process is, is uh, it has started, it's ongoing. But we really haven't started to bear down on how we can use the digital revolution to better serve Canadians and Americans, dare I say, and use the data, the re relevant data, to help move people. We do that now. We did it after 9-11, right, Chris? With goods, with truckers, right? But we haven't done it with um, the kind of situation that uh, Governor Douglas referenced in terms of people wanting to cross the border to be with family or to go skiing. Um, those, um, the, those kinds of activities need to be risk managed. And data will help us manage those risks. So I would just say, I hope as the two governments do their lessons learned exercise, they one, take up our report, but two, look uh, at those kinds of issues, which we didn't do a deep dive on in the report. We simply didn't have the time or the resources, but we reference, and I think they're important. Thank you very much. We already have some questions that have come in from our audience. And if you're watching the live stream through the Wilson website, we encourage you to enter questions into the box that's there. And uh, we'll try to take all of them if we can, uh, given our, our overall time constraint. The first question is a factual question, and I may try to field this one, but let me ask it out loud first. Uh, Glenn writes to us, what hour on November 8th will the USA land border open to non-essential travel? Um, and, and my best sense, sir, and I don't actually, I don't have a hard number here, but uh, one thing that we've discovered when you look at the border is that individual ports of entry have different operating hours. Some are open 24 seven, but some are only open for certain hours of the day. So if this follows the way that Canada's uh, opening to American travelers uh, operated uh, earlier, no certainty that it will, then it would be at the start of operate the operation day and if that's a 24 7 then it would be 1201 uh, a.m and if it uh, is a opens later then it would be whenever that particular post started but that would be my my best guess um, do any of the members of the task force have a have a better all right I, that's tricky because that is a factual question so um, we'll we'll see if we can't find that out for you and send it to, to you through back channels and my crack research team will probably do their best to find an answer while we're talking. Um, next question is from Sydney Manton. What will be done in the future to ensure that family separation is always prevented when alternatives are available and considered compassionately in any border decision making which could hold this impact. Uh, anyone here, what can we do with uh, the family separation issue, um, which, which was so tragic in so many cases? Governor Douglas. Well, if uh, the governments uh, follow our recommendation of, of managing risk, then that should yeah. take care of itself. 
Um, in, in, in many cases, uh, crossing the border is, uh, is a virtually risk-free experience. As uh, Jean knows, we have villages that are bifurcated by the international border in Vermont and Quebec. We have buildings that straddle the border. Um, uh, it's not very risky to walk across the street uh, if, if your neighbor or relative happens to, uh, to live in another country. Um, so if it's based on risk management and, and um, uh, a determination on that basis, then I think uh, uh, these problems will be addressed. But I want to reemphasize, as uh, several of us have suggested, how serious this is. Um, you know, um, weddings taking a place across the border, uh, visits at uh, six-foot intervals with um, border patrol agents uh, vigilantly ensuring that uh, people don't get any closer than that. It, I mean, it just seems ridiculous to someone who lives in a part of the country where uh, where we don't re regard Quebecers as foreigners. <laughs> They're our friends and neighbors. And and so we have to uh, get back to a point that respects the uh, the sovereignty of each country, but but does it in a in a risk based way. And could I, uh, Chris, add, Please. you know, Jim, Jim and I are neighbors. And, and by the way, you know, we, we think we're the luckiest people in the world to be uh, Vermont as a, as a neighbor of ours and to, uh, you know, and I, I, I say that because it needs, we need to remind ourselves how lucky we are, Canadians and Americans, to have each other as neighbors and allies and friends. We don't always agree on everything, but I'll tell you, it's a pretty good neighborhood. Now, what Jim is referring to is pretty important because we could understand at the outset of this pandemic that governments, to be able to get a, a line of sight on what's happening in the science, you make a decision, you say, well, there's going to be zero risk and we're just closing the border. But after a while, there was enough scientific evidence to be able to uh, be uh, manage a situation where people who are fully vaccinated and tested, for example, could come in. What we ended up with instead was a situation where border agents are not who are not trained to do this have to uh, engage with people on their motivations. Now, of course, it is part of their their work. I mean, in, in circumstances, there are you know people who have ill intent who want to come in, but motivations. I mean, pushing it to the point where no, you can't go see your mother. But you can, you know, so this puts everyone in a, a position and managing a situation that, frankly, uh, wasn't uh, necessary in as much as the data, the science could allow you to make a good, solid decision on uh, on managing risk. Uh, we could have uh, opened earlier and allowed people to uh, to travel. And one thing I, I Jim said something important in his opening remarks. The risk we have is that people will change their habits. You know, if after two years you can't go to the house you bought in Vermont or you can't go to the house you bought in North Hadley, well, you may, uh, are you used to traveling? What? So that's, there's going to be, there's going to be uh, consequences and there's going to be an impact and some scars. And some of it could have been avoided had we uh, taken, uh, governments taken a different approach. Governor Gregoire, are you uh, looking to jump in? Great. So I, I just want to share a story with all of you because I think it, it, it reflects what both of my colleagues have just articulated. Um, one of the concerns that we have is will we ever go back to the relationship, the ease, uh, the tourism, the commercial, the economic relationships that are pre-COVID? Uh, for years, Canada has been our number one trading partner. Uh, will that return? But I'll tell you a story that I think epitomizes this question, and that is the story of Point Roberts. Point Roberts is on a peninsula. It is American territory. But in order for it to actually, the residents to actually access uh, the country, they have a 25-mile trek that they must undertake through British Columbia to get into the state of Washington. Imagine what has happened there. We do not know whether they'll ever recover from this because they have been completely cut off and isolated. And back to the what are lessons learned? Well, we ask our delegation in particular on numerous occasions for some exceptions for those individuals with a very unique setting and we were denied. Uh, so 
what, what I think to the caller's question is, we don't want to separate families, but quite candidly, at the end of the day, we don't want a separation. We really fundamentally believe that there are technological advances. There are opportunities. If we can keep planes in the air where people can travel, we can keep that border open and we can be mindful. And if in fact, we could use some examples, some tests to learn from those and apply those across the border. Uh, we weren't given that opportunity to do that as well as we should and learn those easy lessons by trusted folks. So there are a lot of really good lessons to be learned here, but the number one objective at the end of the day is not to separate families, but not to separate these two countries because we can do better to avoid that and we must do better. Powerfully said, and McClellan, I, I wanna give you a chance to weigh in on this before we move on, if you'd like. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess I, I would say in terms of um, the border, and I go to you, Chris, particularly because you were so involved after 9-11, um, which I, I was in the government of Canada at the time. And we wondered what impact that would have on the border, whether the border would ever go back to the way it was, right? Well, we discovered it didn't, right? In a very important way, in that we decided, our two countries, that you would have to have a passport to enter each other's nations. First time, an awful lot of Canadians and even more Americans didn't have a passport. They had a license, right, Governor Gregoire, which was what was required uh, to uh, cross the border. All of a sudden that changed because of what we learned from 9-11. So there will be learnings coming out of this situation. And we adjusted quite rapidly. And now you don't hear anyone complaining about the fact they have to have a passport to cross the border. Um, it's part of our lives. And we expect it in terms of our national security and our personal security. So we're not quite sure what additional measures may be required coming out of the pandemic uh, to keep us all safe. And th there may be additional me measures around, for example, proof of vaccine. But I have every confidence that Canadians and Americans will adapt as long as if there are additional requirements, they are reasonable, they are based on evidence, uh, and they are transparent in terms of why they're being requested of us. I have no doubt whatsoever that Canadians and Americans will adapt. And just as after 9-11, life doesn't return to so-called normal. It is a new life uh, with a set of new procedures. But in fact, we all live happily within that domain. So I, I, I can't tell people what might be additional information requirements, but it wouldn't surprise me if there are some. And hopefully we use digital technology uh, to ensure that it is uh, transparent, but private uh, privacy interests are protected and it's providing only that information that helps keep us all safer and healthier. Thank you all very much. Our next question comes from an expert that you've spoken to, Laura, Dr. Lori Trotman, at the, who's the director of the Border Policy Research Institute at the Western Washington University in Bellingham. Um, she asks, why wasn't there better coordination and collaboration between the United States and Canada on the restrictions, recognizing we did do some things well at the beginning, and what mechanisms were missing as the pandemic dragged on and the restrictions were made largely intact? Uh, was there something holding back uh, better coordination between the two governments? Did you have a sense from, from what we heard? Let me just say one thing here. And I, I don't know how much of what I'm going to say uh, related to a lack of coordination, but coming out of SARS and during SARS, the Federal Department of Health, our uh, public health officials and CDC worked very closely to 
every day. They were on the telephone with each other. They were in communication with each other. They were sharing information. It is one of the great tragedies, as far as I'm concerned, that in the early days of COVID, CDC was missing in action. And it took a long time for CDC to find its legs. And there may have been political reasons for that, or I, I'm not really the best to comment on that. But I do think had our public health officials and CDC been working closely together, as they did during SARS, that there may have been a better information flow, flow going up to elected officials and public servants so that they could make uh, more targeted decisions around important issues such as the border. Excellent. Anyone else want to comment on this question? Governor Gregoire. You know, I, I would say to Lori, I, I really do fundamentally believe that the kind of go it alone and the unfortunate um, circumstance here where we didn't look back at the planning and the lessons learned, as Anne is referring to from times before, was in large part driven by this issue of zero risk. Um, many elected officials on both sides of the border were saying we have to make science based decisions, we have to listen to public health. Well, anybody who has served in public office know that whenever you make a decision, there are multiple voices that need to be heard, not a single voice. And we were driven and should have been driven by health and public safety. But the idea that we thought we could ever achieve, literally on anything, zero risk, is just not even remotely plausible. And you have to hear those other voices. And those other voices include private citizens and families. It includes the private sector. It includes uh, tourism. It includes all of those respective things. But we didn't balance. We were driven by uh, a goal of zero uh, tolerance for risk, which is non-achievable, whether we fly in the air or drive a car. And I think that fed into go it alone by the respective countries and unfortunately did not lead to the kind of coordination that we need. When we don't unite our two countries to give, here's the plan, here's what we're going to do, we're united on it, it breeds distrust and confusion on the, on the public, which is the exact opposite of what you need in a crisis like a pandemic. So I think a big lesson learned, Lori, is we need to go back to the old reports. We need to see that collaboration and coordination among the two nations is imperative. We need to listen to the public and the local electeds and to our own uh, governmental legislative bodies. If we do that, I think we have a much better result than what we've seen here. Just one thought, Chris. Uh, um, we note in our report the uh, lack of involvement by the legislative branch. Um, not any or many public hearings on the process. Uh, um, it's noted that the, um, in the prime ministerial debates in the recent Canadian campaign, the issue didn't come up at all. Um, there was a northern border task force led by two members of Congress from the state of New York that were trying to get some uh, traction. But I, I, it seemed to me ironic that in two democracies, <laughs> there, there wasn't more discussion by our congressional and parliamentary leaders. And that might have uh, brought some of these issues to the fore. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, next question comes from Paul Hill, who, uh, who's writing us from Saskatchewan. He notes that our report concludes what is common sense, but decisions uh, did not. And uh, Saskatchewan is still closed. Uh, millions are being lost at airports, private companies uh, unable to do international business travel people getting around this by going to other provinces like Alberta or, or Manitoba. Um, how could this regional factor, um, uh, the, the potential for variation based on local conditions actually work in practice? Um, and any thoughts on that? Question from Paul. Can I, uh, Chris, first of all, thank you, Paul, for the, uh, the question. And uh, a few of us have the, uh, the privilege of knowing Paul uh, uh, and a very prominent citizen, Canadian citizen, uh, who's from Saskatchewan. Uh, 
we can walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, the Point Roberts example that Chris uh, Gregoire offers uh, speaks to that. I mean, there you have uh, circumstances that justified a made to measure solution as opposed to just applying a broad based measure. And so you can on a regional basis do that. Will there people there? There will be people who will want to work around that. But if you keep it also at a scientific test when people enter the country or not, let's say there's a, a vaccine uh, of a requirement and or a test requirement, you should be able to manage that risk at uh, an acceptable level. So so you can adapt and you can make it uh, that way. That's such a long border with different circumstances. We do speak in the report about, you know, the fact that Canada and the United States have explored a lot of pre-border in initiatives. Why could an individual who's going to the land border not have the ability, for example, to uh, advise before, 24 hours before, do some paperwork that if they need to do it, information about being vaccinated or tested. And when they show up, uh, the border uh, officials know they're coming and, and that would expedite uh, the process. So there's all that area that we can explore that would make things simpler for everyone. Um, next question we have is from Stephanie Defoe, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Niagara Falls Bridge Commission. She asks, do we see any movement on the 72 hour PRC testing requirement upon re-entry to Canada in the near term? I'm not, not sure whether we have anything on that, but does anybody have a, can anyone shed light on that testing requirement? Well, the only thing I would say is the political pressure is growing uh, on uh, the Canadian government to at least reassess the requirement. And uh, I, I can't, say, and I don't think we have any new information, Jean, the government has not indicated it's moving away from that requirement, but the pressure is growing on the government to reassess the requirement. Chris, just rapidly, I think Certainly. the general sense we had is that as we look to the future, there'll probably be a proof of vaccination requirement on both sides for the foreseeable future. If a pandemic happens, or something, or something breaks out. Testing would then be added. I'm, you know, if you look at the logic of now testing, we know as the question alludes to PCR and and the antigenic are two very two different mm. things, and so there's a lot that needs to still be done on the technology to allow more flexible testing at a reasonably reliable level, so that individuals can do that and self test before they arrive and make it more less onerous. But the PCR is onerous. I mean, that's a it's costly, it's onerous, it's complicated, time consuming. So uh, I think we, we can do better, but it will depend on the level or, of the uh, contamination. Those that will mm -hmm. probably determine what type of measures will be applied. Chris, I think uh, that's a very important point. That should also be a risk-based determination. Uh, it uh, may ebb and flow depending upon the uh, severity of a disease at any particular point in it might be different from um, Washington to Maine too, uh, depending upon where the outbreak is. And one other issue uh, very quickly there is, uh, uh, Jean alluded to the cost, uh, is the question of equity. Uh, uh, who's gonna pay for it? I mean, we have a lot of uh, friends and neighbors who are not particularly well off, and if they need to pay a, a pretty significant amount for a test on a frequent basis, um, uh, I think that's a matter of concern too. Absolutely, the Governor Gregoire. Add to that, Chris, is, um, you know, when we think about going forward, one of the lessons learned here, I think, for the future is we are, as, as Jean put it, we are going to be required to show proof of vaccination. But I would hope that we can collaborate and come up with a common way in which I can show proof of vaccination, rather than I do it one way if I'm a Canadian and I do it another way if I'm an American. And so one of the lessons I think learned here about collaboration is let's put it, put it in place right away with respect to that. While I think the private sector has already gone out in front and looked at that technology, it's there, it's ready, it's available to both governments to start reviewing and, and choosing as they wish. But I would hope for the traveling public that we would find a common way in which to show proof of vaccination. 
Um, absolutely. We have a question from Ken White with the Thousand Islands Association. He notes the local border region is like a third country between overlapping Canada and the US. Restrictions and risks for these special border regions need to be different than typical country to country travel. Do you see a special class of border region ever being recognized in the future? This connects perhaps to our discussion of Point Roberts and, and, and other special zones. Can we have that variation? Is that reasonable or achievable? Any thoughts? I don't think it's very high on the list of priorities of the government of Canada. I mean, I, I just have to be honest. But is it achievable? Yes. I, I have no doubt it could be achievable, but you have to have political will um, to move forward uh, with something like that. And the Point Roberts example would probably tell us that uh, there was not political will in that case, and it, it's the most compelling example we have of something that's, you know, quite unreasonable, actually, at the end of the day, in, in terms of how government dealt with it. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't wish to be a wet blanket here, but I really don't think the government of Canada will be taking that issue up anytime soon because there may be unintended consequences in areas completely unrelated to the border. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Anne. Um, Justin, uh, writing in a personal capacity, asks, how can trusted traveler program membership be integrated into border reopening plans in both countries? He notes the app Arrive Can lacks any special features for Nexus members. Is this a missed opportunity? And is there still room for correction linking some of these voluntary programs with uh, advanced information for border decision makers? Any thoughts on that? Yes, well, you know, Nexus, uh, Global Entry uh, have been game changers in regards to how the border is managed. And uh, and by the way, I think we're, we're going to see as much of a pivot as we saw after 9-11. You remember after 9-11 that the American ambassador to Canada, uh, Paul Salucci, uh, at the time, made a very uh, memorable statement that from now on, security trumps trade. And that became the new uh, norm, and Canadians accepted that very, uh, uh, very rapidly because we agreed. Now, as we look ahead, uh, healthcare and health and protection of citizens will also be an imperative, and changes will be made adjusting. So, what we should do is look at Nexus, look at global, look at how we can adjust it. I've dealt with the Arrive Can also which is good. I mean, I, I, I should have referred to it earlier because that's the kind of tool that we should be using, but it also needs to be adapted, Chris. Frankly, I've used it. I found it, frankly, uh, not a very friendly app in some instances and its application after. I'm not blaming the government. I don't want to because, uh, you know, we all get it that they have to organize this in a very short period of time and get it going. But, uh, and let me add two things, an impression, I think, I got at least from how all this unfolded. We, in the end, I, I guess we sort of get a sense the governments were overwhelmed. And the other part is that everything was very centralized. Now, maybe centralization is a strong trend of the last 20 years in politics and uh, decision making because of media and you have to react. But I don't think in this case it served us very well. And, and, and thus, as Jim has pointed out, I, we were all a little surprised when we look back and say, well, why didn't they? ask uh, parliamentary committees or uh, committees in Congress to look at some of these issues and flesh them out for them. I mean, they don't have to do everything themselves and they would have played the useful role that they should play, but that didn't happen. Mind you, it didn't happen in state and provincial legislatures also. So take note, I mean, as we look ahead, we have institutions whose job it is to do that and they were not used. Excellent point. Um, we are coming to our last 10 minutes, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions with the indulgence of our, our questioners. Um, one comes from Amy Mountcastle, who's a professor of anthropology. She asks, how can the flow of digital information be better managed during a pandemic? In two ways, 
uh, contradictory scientific information, as well as uh, inf false information about uh, where the pandemic might be erupting, that sort of thing. Can we create more reliable means of communicating with the public? And we can we uh, find a way to avoid uh, some of the misleading information and the internet rumors that uh, that we had in this particular academic uh, epidemic? Sorry, not academic. Uh, anyone anyone want to respond on that? Uh, have a thought. You know, if I could hearken back, I think uh, germane to this question, to how we dealt with H1N1, and uh, Governor, you may recall this. Uh, we dealt with it completely different than how we dealt with this pandemic. And that was, we got on a call, we governors, all 50, got on a call initially weekly, initially weekly, with the head of Homeland Security, uh, the head of Health and Human Services um, and others, sometimes the then vice president uh, and so on. And what we got was the absolute up-to-date information uh, about what was going on, what they were expecting, how they were reacting. And we, as agents, went out and disseminated that. So we got the best science, the most recent information and so on. None of that took place here whatsoever. Uh, instead, we, I mean, it was, it was guessing, there wasn't coordination, it was social media, which of course has led to many problems, at least here in the United States. So uh, I, I will come back to, and, and what we started here in Washington state was, uh, I put the business community on a daily call at noon where I had all experts who come on in one hour and feed all of those employers with absolute information based on science and, and all the data that was available, they in turn disseminated that immediately to all of their respective employees. So we re reached hundreds of thousands of people in Washington state. When, when there isn't that kind of information available and that means, then we get made up stuff. Then we get what we have experienced and we're still fighting that misinformation. So again, it comes back to where were we in the beginning of coordinating and sharing common data across both countries? How, why weren't we sharing information back and forth so that we had a good impression about what was going on in both countries? And then feed that information up through our legislative channels and our congressional channels and our parliamentarian channels. I remember it well, uh, Chris. Uh, um, vi video conferencing back then was uh, somewhat rudimentary, <laughs> but I recall being on the, some meetings with our former colleague from Kansas, who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and I think because she had um, served at the state level, understood the importance of communicating with governors and getting information out as uh, quickly and accurately as possible. So you're right, uh, um, dissemination of information through the appropriate uh, channels um, uh, is a good way to, uh, to start. I, I think the caller raises the question that goes well beyond the uh, pandemic in terms of uh, how we control information in the metaverse or whatever it is now. Um, and uh, I think that's a little beyond the scope of the task force. Fair enough. I, I have a question now that seems to be directed mainly at uh, the Canadians. And so I'll, I'll uh, send this one to you, Anne and, and Jean Charest. Um, the question relates to whether PCR tests uh, become something of a crutch for public officials and public opinion that uh, general health checks, inquiries into people's uh, health status, becomes a norm, this new intrusiveness. And uh, there's a, a, a sort of add-on question asking whether PCR tests are even necessary for short trips. A uh, gentleman tells us that uh, he can't tow a broken boat from one mile north of the border to its marina three miles south without a way to travel uh, on land 25 miles, take a test, and then stay overnight because of quarantines. This goes, I guess, again to the, the question of how data then changes the way we think of the border. Um, are there ways that we can simplify this process? And, and are there ways to work around special conditions or, or create some way for people to share this information without requiring a test every time? Um, any thoughts on that? Since this is a Canadian requirement, I'll steer it to you, Anne, and to you, Jean. 
Well, uh, I would just say that, yes, there there are, of course, ways to simplify this, and they will probably be considered going forward as part of a lessons learned exercise. Government had to respond very quickly to a global pandemic, learning more about the science of the disease, the infection, almost on a weekly, maybe even daily basis. So government reacted as quickly as they did with the tools that they thought would would provide maximum protection. Again, that zero risk mentality probably at play here a little bit. Um, so I am sure going forward, uh, people will look at, because Canadians and Americans are asking their governments to look at, whether there are simpler, more transparent ways uh, to um, have the border operate, uh, without without being an un, unduly intrusive or uh, unduly invading people's privacy. But um, I think the test is, it is what it is. I uh, personally, having done it any number of times crossing the border recently, I, it's, it's not an intrusive test in my mind. I, I suppose the requirement might be the intrusion. Um, and the cost is not insignificant for a lot of people, as we've already discussed. But uh, so I am sure going forward, uh, there'll be a lot of attention paid to um, whether there are other and better uh, risk management tools to ensure that you're still doing everything you can as a government to protect your citizens' health. And Chris, I agree with Anne, so I think she Anne covered a lot of that the ground there. That was so so nice with this task force because uh, great minds often came to similar conclusions. So I'm <laughs> pleased to see that continuing. I have a um, uh, the other question, which I'm going to direct at our two Americans. Um, it comes from two different. Uh, viewers who are asking related to Mexico. First, the question that the U.S. seemed to have a land border policy so that uh, what we did on the northern border had to be also simultaneous with what we did on the southern border. And to add a twist, one of our questioners asked the question, um, given that Mexico has had uh, no vaccination requirement for entry by foreign nationals, um, is it Go, if we don't have a common policy, how can we have a North American response to a pandemic unless we're all on the same page in terms of testing and sharing information? I, I don't know, Governor Douglas, Governor uh, Gregoire, what would you say to this connection to Mexico? Is this uh, a misnomer or can this be made to work? Some of the earlier uh, uh, discussions in the previous decades, of course, involved uh, all three North American countries, and, and I think it's important to have those uh, discussions. But uh, if, um, if we focus on risk assessment and base our restrictions on, on uh, the appropriate level of risk, then there certainly can be some variation. As I suggested earlier, I, I could see a scenario where uh, testing requirements are in place at one point of, on the American-Canadian border and not another, depending upon what uh, kind of outbreak is uh, prevalent at the time. So I, I think it's important to, uh, to um, uh, have a, a tripartite um, um, communication and, and overall plan, uh, but uh, there's got to be enough flexibility based on the circumstances on the ground. And they are different borders. Governor Gregoire. So I concur wholeheartedly with uh, Governor Douglas. Um, I, I do agree with history that we, it would be good for us to plan together, but I, I don't think that we should be hampered by planning together, by execution together, because as this pandemic has evidence, we are very different uh, on the Northern border than we are on the Southern border. And I think we have to be willing to be flexible uh, depending on those circumstances. So I would still adhere to the policy of let's plan together, but I, I just disagree when it comes to the, the pandemic like COVID that we execute exactly together. Instead, we executed in three different ways, uh, which has, has complicated and compounded the problems. So again, I think planning is good together. I think we execute uh, together depending on the border. Uh, in other words, with our colleagues in Canada and with our colleagues in Mexico, but 
I think we recognize they are two completely different borders. Thank you, Governor. And now we've come to the end of our, our time for this event. Viewers will note that we'll post the full report here on the website on the same page that you're watching this event. Um, we would welcome your comments. Please feel free to send them to us at the Wilson Center. But for now, it, it falls to me to thank our task force. You volunteered your time, you gave us a lot of time, and you did a lot of meetings to hear from North Americans, Canadians, Americans, and experts to try to come up with some very good recommendations. So. Uh, on behalf of myself and my team, but also I think a lot of us who care about good candidates relations, I want to thank Anne McClellan, Jim Douglas, Christine Gregoire, and Jean Charest for your, for your selfless volunteering and for your participation in today's event. My name is Christopher Sands. I'm director of the Canada Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.